So Whitaker's credentials give a lot of added weight to his convention challenging position. As a journalist, the quality of his work on the pharmaceutical industry and the mentally ill has been recognized by several national awards, including a George Polk Award for medical writing and a National Association of Science Writers Award for best magazine article. A series that he co-wrote for the Boston Globe about uh, the abuse of mentally ill patients uh, was nominated in 1998 for a Pulitzer Prize. Um, and not only does he write well, anatomy reads like a historic novel, um, but he also has the courage and the clarity of thought to organize scientific findings from around the world and put them into a cogent and compelling confrontation for the big machinery of the pharmaceutical companies. Anatomy won the 2010, 2010 excuse me, Investigative Reporters and Editors Book Award for Best Investigative Journalism. Whitaker writes with both passion and compassion. His passion for pursuit of the evidence earns him the respect that he will need to go up against the big machinery. Um, anyone who describes the musty, dingy basement of the Harvard Medical School Library as an exciting place to be, um, it's filled with medical journals and he talks about the thrill of the chase from one citation to the next. We're talking about someone who is a research fanatic. <laughs> um, but it's his compassion for the people whose lives are touched by mental illness uh, that is really at the heart of this book. It's easy enough to tune into high profile examples of the potential cost to society when psychiatric illness is not effectively managed. And we have examples like the recent tragedies in Tucson and also at Virginia Tech. But Whitaker's bigger news and the far more staggering information is the cost of human potential throughout our communities Probably everybody here knows somebody, someone in your family, a neighbor, uh, it's a coworker, someone who has had a bout with mental illness and has struggled to deal with that. And it is Whitaker's empathy for this suffering and his belief that there's a better approach that motivates him as an advocate for truth and a new brand of informed consent in the business of psychiatric treatments. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Robert Whitaker. Well, thanks a lot for having me. Uh, I have a quick question for y'all. How many are here with a special interest in mental, you know, psychiatric care, that sort of thing, or just, okay, just wanted to get a sense because I've been traveling around doing a lot of speaking to sort of professional audiences and every once in a while make it a little bit too technical. But here's the, the what this book is about a puzzle. And it's really about a puzzle that I think we as a society really need to solve. And the, and the puzzle is this. Our understanding as a, uh, as a society is that psychiatric care, beginning with the arrival of Thorazine in asylum medicine in 1955, took this great leap forward. And you'll read in conventional histories of psychiatry about a psychopharmacal revolution that has unfolded since that date. And the story goes like this. Uh, Thorazine was the first antipsychotic, and you can hear in that word uh, almost as if it's an antibiotic, right? It's specific to psychosis. Then we get antidepressants shortly after that. We get anti-anxiety agents. And we also, in the, shortly after this, we begin emptying the state hospitals. And the thought is, this is what, it's the arrival of these drugs that makes it possible to keep care for people in the, in the community. And you can read, like in a conventional history of psychiatry written by Edward Shorter at the University of Toronto, that the arrival of Thorazine in asylum medicine was as profound a leap forward as, the, uh, as penicillin in infectious medicine. And if so, that is an incredible leap forward. There have been few medical advances as important as the arrival of penicillin. And if you go a step further in this conventional wisdom story, it, it goes like this. We had the first generation psychiatric drugs, and then beginning in 1988, we got Prozac. And Prozac is this, uh, the first of the second generation drugs that are said to be safer and more effective than the first generation. And it's since 1988, so we got the SSRIs, replaced the old tricyclic antidepressants. Then we got a class of drugs called the atypical antipsychotics, replaced Thorazine and Haldol, and those are old drugs, et cetera. And it's since the arrival of those drugs that we've really embraced a sort of a medication-based paradigm of care. And to give an example of this, um, in 1988, we spent, as a country, $800 million in psychiatric drugs. Today we're spending more than $40 billion a year, so that's a 50-fold increase. You also see the use of these drugs now at every stage of life, with kids, 
you know, adults, the elderly, et cetera. And there's somewhere between 12 and 15% of all Americans now take a psychiatric drug on a daily basis. I just heard from a Tufts University uh, professor who told me that 15% of all women giving birth now are on an SSRI while they're pregnant. So this is just gives you a sense of the extent to which th we have embraced this, the use of these medications. Now, the book is set up as a puzzle, and here's the puzzle. So we have this story that we've had this great advance in care. What I did as a beginning point is just look at the number of people disabled in the United States due to mental illness and track it over this time from 1955 forward. Because usually when you get a great advance in care, you'd expect that disability rate to go down, right? Or at least stay the same. And in fact, in 1999, uh, US Surgeon General David Satcher said, prior to the arrival of these drugs, psychiatry lacked treatments that would prevent chronicity now we have all these safe and effective drugs that enable people to live sort of normal lives. So if that's true, you should see a disability rate staying the same or going down, right? So what I did is I tracked the disability rate as a starting point. And if you go back to 1955, you find that there were 560,000 people in state and county mental hospitals. Those were people who couldn't care for themselves. Dig into that data a bit, you find that 200,000 were really there for nursing home issues, Alzheimer's, that sort of thing. So there are 360,000, quote, disabled mentally ill at the start of this revolution. And that's a disability rate of about one in every 484. Okay, we do deinstitutionalize after that, and people who've, tr who've traced the disability rate said, in order to trace that forward after deinstitutionalization, when we began caring for people in the, you know, in the community, you have to look at people on SSI or SSDI, these are government disability programs, who are eligible for that disability due to mental illness. You find that in 1987, that number was 1.25 million. So it went from 360,000 to 1.25 million. Um, so the, the, rate in, the disability rate per capita rate in 1955 was 1 in 468, okay? By 1988, it had grown to 1 in 184, more than a doubling the disability rate. Now the obvious caveat is, well, maybe you're comparing apples to oranges, right? Maybe you needed to be much sicker to be in a hospital than to be on disability in 1987. So from this point forward, though, we have the same metric, just number of people on SSI or SSDI due to mental illness. And this is the time we really embrace the use of these medications. Well, the number of people on disability has climbed from 1.25 million people in 1987 to more than 4 million people today. So it's tripled. And now we're down to a disability rate of 1 in 76. So you have a beginning, I think, of a, of a question arising here, right? Why, as we've abra embraced the medications, as a, and said to be so helpful, have we seen this rise in the disability rate? A couple other bits of the puzzle. Um, in 1987, there were 16,200 children on disability. Now there's more than 600,000. So 35-fold increase, you're seeing it in the children as well. Finally, the part of the puzzle is this. If you look what's driving the disability numbers, it's not psychotic disorders, it's, neuro it's affective disorders. It's depression and bipolar disorder, and really bipolar disorder. And if, if, if our society needs to solve something, one part of this puzzle it is, where are all the bipolar patients coming from? 40 years ago, bipolar was called manic depressive illness, and its prevalence was about one in 5,000 in epidemiological studies. Any guess what it is today? Adult bipolar, what's the, what's the prevalence? Any guess? Okay, it's one in 50. So you're basically right. So a hundred-fold increase in bipolar illness in the last 40 years. So we have to figure out what's going on. Now what I did, that was just, these were numbers that just, they don't prove anything, right? But they do raise some questions. And the questions that I wanted to look at were two in re regarding medications. One, how do medications shape the long-term course of major mental disorders, right? So I look at how do they shape the long-term course of schizophrenia? How do they shape the long-term course of depression? anxiety and bipolar. That's one puzzle. And then the second puzzle is, is this. Could we be creating bipolar patients? Uh, yes? Yes, it's a great question. And, and you know, raise questions, whatever. Yes, same thing. In the last 15, 20 years, uh, Iceland, for example, has tripled the number of people on disability due to depression. Uh, UK, same thing, tripling. And I was just in Canada a couple days ago. Uh, depression and affective disorders are now the number one 
that's the big thing driving their disabilities number as well. So basically, every, at least in every English-speaking country which has adopted this paradigm of care, you're seeing this extraordinary rise in disability due to affective disorders. So you want to know what's going on. And so the second part of this puzzle was, could we be creating bipolar patients? In other words, they have to be coming from somewhere. And the thought is that maybe you have a paradigm of care where you have people come in with a milder problem, let's say a milder bout of depression, they're put on an antidepressant, and maybe people have a bad response to that, like a manic response, and now they move into the bipolar category. It could be sort of a byproduct of widespread use of these medications. So those were the two questions I wanted to look at. Now, um, I've been doing a lot of talking at sort of, even to psychiatrists and all. If you look at how drugs get approved, they get approved because they knock down a target symptom better than placebo. So if you have an antidepressant and you test it over a short term six weeks, it knocks down depression. In other words, depression decreases a little more than in the placebo patients. And if it does that, and the side effects aren't too bad, it'll get approved by the FDA. And that's really, and that's how, that's how antipsychotics get approved, mood stabilizers, et cetera. But what you don't know in that data is how does it affect people long term? Because long term use can be very different from short term. And what I think is important about this book is I think this is the first real exercise, and <laughs> Anita talked about my love of the Harvard Medical <laughs> Library. It, it, it's the first real book to try to answer that question. How do medications shape long-term outcomes, which may be very different? And what I'll do is real quickly is look at that question for antidepressants, because that's the most familiar one. But the, uh, the, and here's, here's the process I went through. The first thing I went through is I went through the medical literature, and could I find mainstream researchers who had looked at this question, and could they point to studies that said, yes, we are improving the long-term course of this disorder. Does that make sense? I want to see if they have, there's some mainstream evidence out there saying, yes, here's the natural course of depression with antidepressants, we're doing better. You do that, and you will find something fairly quickly quite surprising. And it doesn't mean whether you look for antipsychotics, schizophrenia, whatever the medication is, time and time again, researchers conclude, we just don't have evidence that these are improving the long-term course of major mental disorders. And you even find that for schizophrenia, which is quite surprising. Yes? How is it shown in clinicians? For A, the propensity for sleep pairing is greater, obviously, although it has to be tested. And B, the propensity to diagnose because of whatever extent the drug is used. Yeah, that's going to go into the disability numbers, right? I mean, in terms of, I mean, you, you, you know, you, what you're asking me is, there's, is more people coming into care, right? Well, that's maybe part of the bipolar problem. <laughs> we'll get into that in a second. But so what I'm first going to do is how do you trace how medications, what does science tell us about how they trace the long-term course of, of, of mental disorders, okay? So the first thing you got to do is make sure that the major stream, what, what does the major researchers say about that? And they'll say we lack information. And then you try to put together a puzzle. Now, the medications have been around for 50 years, and here's what I did. First, I tried to set a baseline for each disorder. What, did, what was the course of this disorder prior to the arrival of medications, right? That might be the natural spectrum. That's number one part of the puzzle. The second part is, when the drugs are introduced, do the doctors notice anything different? And the reason is, when they get introduced, doctors at this point are used to seeing, say, the natural spectrum of outcomes or the spectrum of unmedicated depression, manic depressive illness, et cetera. Do they notice a difference in their patients? We're going to look at that clinical expertise. Then we're going to look at any randomized studies that might have lasted longer, a year, two years, three years. Then we're going to look at epidemiological studies. We're going to see what is the modern course of depression, say, and what's the, what was the old course. So we're going to compare that. Was there a change in epidemiology? And finally, we're going to look at whatever modern longitudinal studies we can find in which you end up, you just follow a group of patients for 10 years. It's not randomized and see how the unmedicated patients do versus the medicated. And what we want to see if all these different parts of the puzzle fit together. Does that make sense? All right, here's what happens if you do this for depression. Uh, you go back, and this really is a, so obviously I go back to NIMH studies, et cetera, and what you find in terms of depression prior to the arrival of the antidepressants, it was A, a fairly rare disorder. Fewer than one in 1,000 adults suffered a bout of, quote, major depression each year in, say, the 1950s. In 1955, there were only 
7,250 people in the United States, ho adults, hospitalized for a, a bout of depression. Uh, in other words, there were some people in it already, but that was the number of first admissions for depression that year. It was also an, a disease of the middle-aged and elderly. 90% of the admissions were 35 and older. Now, do you know what people under 35 was happening to them when they were getting psychological distress? It was defined as anxiety back then. So it was just a little bit, and it's not that people in their 20s didn't experience distress. It was just defined in a different manner. What was the long-term course of depression? If you look at hospitalized cohorts, 50%, well, first of all, 80, 90% would be out of the hospital in 8, 10 months. Depression was expected to lift. And then if you followed these first hospitalized cohorts for a long time, you would find that 50% would never be re-hospitalized again. About 30% in the next 15 years might be hospitalized once or twice. And then there would be perhaps 10 to 15% that would become chronically ill. Now, because of that epidemiological data, here's what you heard the top experts in the country say about depression in the 1960s. Jonathan Cole. Depression is, on the whole, one of the psychiatric conditions with the best prognosis for eventual recovery with or without treatment. Most depressions are self-limited. George Winokur, Washington University. Assurance can be given to a patient and to his family that subsequent episodes of illness after a first depression will not tend toward a more chronic course. Dean Schuyler, who was head of the depression section at the NIMH at this time, he says, spontaneous recovery rates are so high, exceeding 50% within a few months, that it is, quote, difficult to judge the efficacy of a drug, a treatment, or psychotherapy in depressed patients. Most, depressed pati most depressive episodes, he explained, will, quote, run their course and terminate with virtually complete recovery without specific intervention. So it was seen as an episodic thing. And, th and we're talking, by the way, this is people hospitalized for depression, these cohorts, people who can't get out of bed, they got their head in their hands. This is serious depression. It was still expected to uh, remit, and in many people, they would just never have another course of depression in their life. Because of that, by the way, when antidepressants were first used, you hear the people saying, okay, maybe we can't improve really on this long-term course since it's so good, but we can help people get better faster. Okay, that was really the idea with this. And you can see why they want to do that. Now, as you follow the long-term course, the second part of the puzzle, so that's the baseline, you find when the drugs are introduced, this clinical perception over and over again by many doctors. Boy, my patients are getting better faster. And then they're relapsing into depression more frequently. You see that paradox in their perception show up right away. So for example, German physician H.P. Hoheisel in 1966, he says exposure to antidepressants seem to be shortening the intervals between depressive episodes, he says. A Bulgarian psychiatrist, 1970, the tricyclics are changing the disorder to, quote, a more chronic course. Yugoslavian doctor, these drugs are causing a chronification of the disease. And the thought was this that was raised at the time. People, many people will get better on the antidepressant, but they don't fully remit. The depression doesn't go fully away. And for whatever reason, when it doesn't go fully away, it seems like they relapse quite frequently. So people said the problem is, People are only partially cured, and then depression returns, quote, more readily. Because of this concern, there was the first study of this in 1973 by a Dutch psychiatrist named J.D. Van Skyen, and he did a retrospective study. And he looks back at the five-year outcomes of a, a large number of people, and he divides them, those who took meds and those who did not, and here's what he reported. It was evident, particularly in the female patients, that more systematic long-term antidepressant medication, with or without ECT, exerts a paradoxical effect on the recurrent nature of the vital depression. In other words, this therapeutic approach was associated with an increase in recurrent rate and a decrease in cycle duration. Should this increase be regarded as an untoward long-term side effect of treatment with tricyclic antidepressants? So you see what he is identifying here? Short-term efficacy and at least some evidence of increasing the long-term chronicity of the disorder. You go forward about 15 years and you do studies of first episode patients in this area and people start identifying these extraordinarily high relapse rates after people are exposed to antidepressants. It was such that in 1985, the NIMH convened a mood consensus panel on what was going on. And here's what the NIM NIMH, by the way, is the National Institute of Mental Health. It's the lead agency. It's a National Institute of Health group on psychiatric disorders. And here's what they concluded, and listen really carefully. 
They say improved approaches to the description and classification of mood disorders and new epidemiological studies have demonstrated the recurrent and chronic nature of these illnesses and the extent to which they represent a continual source of distress and dysfunction for affected individuals. You see what they're saying here? What they're saying is here, the old epidemiological studies showed a much more episodic course, less chronicity. Now we're seeing more chronicity. Now they have two possibilities. Either the medications are increasing the chronicity or those old studies were flawed. And what they chose was those old studies were flawed. That's what they're saying here. But remember, they're comparing two different things here, unmedicated versus medicated depression. Shortly after that um, panel, the NIMH conducted its first longer-term, 18-month randomized study of antidepressants. It had four arms, two psychotherapy, placebo, drug. At the end of six weeks, th there was no statistically significant difference in any of the arms, but if you looked at those most severely depressed, it was those treated with the drug that were doing the best. Okay, so there was a carve-out for severely depressed patients over the short term. The drug seemed to provide a significant advantage. Then they continued the, uh, the study for 18 months, and here's what they found. The stay well rate was highest for the psychotherapy groups and lowest for the antidepressant group. And then some researchers from Syracuse University also analyzed the data to also look at the, um, the dropouts, and here's what they concluded. This, they concluded that if you include the dropouts, the results for the drug-treated patients in this NIMH trial, quote, look even worse. Patients receiving the antidepressant were most likely to seek treatment following termination, produced the highest probability of relapse, and exhibited the fewest weeks of reduced or minimal symptoms during the follow-up period. So this is the first randomized study of any length, and you see in this analysis that it was the drug-treated patients that had the lowest stay-well rate. Because of this concern now, a, an, an Italian psychiatrist named Giovanni Fava who also has an appointment at Tufts University, finally raised the obvious issue in a paper in 1994. He says this, antidepressant drugs and depression might be beneficial in the short term, but worsen the progression of the disease in the long term by increasing the biochemical vulnerability to depression. Use of antidepressant drugs may propel the illness to a more malignant and treatment unresponsive course. So he raises this flag, he raises this worry. Now if you put in Fava into PubMed, you'll see he's been raising this worry ever since. I will tell you that some of the leading psychopharmacologists in the United States said we, we need to worry about this, such as Ross Baldessarini at Harvard Univer Medical School. And he's considered one of the deans of a, sort of the uh, history of psychopharmacology. And he writes in response to Fava's uh, letter, this question and the several related matters are not pleasant to contemplate and may seem paradoxical but they now require open-minded and serious clinical and research consideration. I think you can hear in that the validation of at least the worry that the drugs are increasing the chronicity of the disorder. Uh, uh, by the way, I want to say one thing. Let's imagine that you have a natural course where 80% of people are basically doing well long-term, right? Now let's say on a medication basis you have 50% doing well long-term. You still have a lot of people doing well long-term, right? But actually you're stay well rate has gone down. Does that make sense? You have to balance it against what your baseline rate is. It doesn't mean that everybody is turning chronically depressed. We'll get to what modern epidemiological studies say. Anyway, uh, I don't have time to go into this, but Giovanni Fava put together a biological explanation for what he thought was going on. R and what he basically is, you've heard that SSRIs up serotonergic activity in the brain, right? You've seen the ads. The, the understanding is when that happens, that drives the brain into sort of a low serotonergic state. In other words, the, the neurons actually put out less serotonin. You have receptors for serotonin. You end up with fewer receptors. And what the, what the uh, Fava was saying is that's what he's talking about, the, um, the biochemical, biological vulnerability. It's the response to the drug. That's what he's saying. Okay, what's the modern course? What do the epidemiological studies tell us about the modern course of major depression today? Yeah, Ron. Right, so you know what, I'm going to hold that question. He's basically asking for the implications of this, et cetera. And, but we'll get to that because I'm going to try to finish this up in about three, four minutes so we can have questions, okay? I'm sort of rushing through this. Here's the epidemiological today. If you follow a cohort of first episodes, and this is as reported in the American Psychiatric Association textbook. 
If you look at 100, uh, there's one third of the people with suffered an initial bout of major depression, they're non-responders to the drug. In other words, they just don't get better. You follow those people long term, they tend to run a chronic course now. A second group, they're responders. Their depression uh, abates more than 50%, their symptoms, but they don't remit, which means the symptoms don't go entirely away. And that group tends now to relapse back into depression with great frequency, okay? They don't, they just don't get all the way there to being remitted. And now they go back and it's relapsing. One third re remit, the depression goes away, they feel great. We hear the stories of those that remit about one third, about half stay well long term. So if you look at a, a, a first cohort, about 15%, 16% go on an antidepressant and they really stay well long term. You can find this in the American Psychiatric Association textbook, 1999. They say, only 15% of people with unipolar depression experience a single bout of the illness. And for the remaining 85% with each new episode, remissions become less complete and new recurrences develop with less provocation. So you see in the APA textbook this, acknow this acknowledgement of this new course. Finally, also in the 1999 APA textbook of psychiatry, they write, it used to be thought that most patients would eventually recover from a major depression episode. However, more extensive studies have disproved this assumption. It is now known, the APA said, that, quote, depression is a highly recurrent and pernicious disorder. So you can see this recognition that depression has shifted in the modern era. Finally, and I, I won't go through all this because I'm going to be running out of time here, I found one, two, three, four, five, six longer-term studies, naturalistic longitudinal studies that just followed patients and looked at, did they fill an, an antidepressant or did they not, and then just looked at how they did. And what you will find is in every single case, the medicated group had a more chronic course. In other words, more relapses or they suffered more depressive symptoms throughout the time, five minutes. Uh, and, and second of all, their rate of going on to disability was much higher. So for example, in the one NIMH study, it was, uh, the disability rate was three times higher for the medicated group. So since I'm getting the hook here and we don't want to have a five minutes for questions, the story is this. Uh, the medications clearly, and this shows up in the data, have a short-term use. That's why they beat placebo, right? And so you can see that. And there are people, and there's plenty of people who will attest to it, that do well on the medications long-term. That's true. But if you look at outcomes in the aggregate, you do not find, what you find time and time again is increased chronicity of the disorder. And that's whether it might be bipolar, depression, even schizophrenia is you see actually uh, that in the modern era, these disorders run a more chronic course, there's much less employment, much more disability. And so my plea in the book, and the last part, is we need to have this information known in order to, uh, to sort of craft protocols that are sort of m more nuanced, more sensible, and look at long-term outcomes as well. And one of the last problems here is this. I, I found 16 across the thing of modern long-term studies conducted by the NIMH, governments, et cetera, that looked at this question, how are we doing between medicated and unmedicated patients? And time and time again, those findings belied our wisdom of take your drugs for life, that protocol. They never show up in magazines, newspapers, et cetera. None of them. So the public doesn't know about this. And the reason is, is in essence, they don't get, they don't get um, publicized by the American Psychiatric Association. They don't get publicized by the NIMH, frankly. They don't get publicized by the National Alliance on Mentally Ill. We do not have a storytelling machinery that makes these uh, studies, these outcomes, known to the public because they so belie uh, this sort of story we have adopted for our society. So anyway, I'll open up some questions, but my big thing here is this, and I really want to emphasize this every time, and I think maybe I need to mention this. I believe the drugs have a place in, in, the, in the care of psychiatric disorders, but the place they have right now where we put people on and keep them on and we think you can give them to kids, it's not working well for us as a society. And if, if you look at all the chronicity many people are developing, it's not working that as well. Finally, if you want to figure out where the bipolar patients are coming from, they're coming from uh, in the big expansion, uh, use of recreational drugs, illicit drugs, it is marijuana, cocaine, that sort of thing. About 25, 30% of your bipolar cohort will have come through that gateway. The second one is antidepressant stimulants. It is prescribed drugs. Uh, there was a big survey, a Nash, 
A national survey of bipolar patients, 60%, and they asked, when did you have your first manic episode? 60% had their first manic episode after going on an antidepressant. And finally, it is expanded diagnostics. So they've expanded the boundaries of what it is. Anyway, that was an awfully rushed technical explanation. So questions? I'll, I'll try to answer Ron. What was your question again? Yeah. Okay, so his question is about the total cost in the national debate. If you look at our societal spending on mental health services from 2001 to 2007, it doubled from 85 uh, billion to 170 billion. If you, and uh, again, also as part of the expenses of all the people on disability, right? You, know, you all know states are having trouble with their budgets. The federal government's having its budgets. We can't keep going down this path. If you look at the children that are getting on disability and then at age 18, are going on a disability, you know what that person's going to cost the country? Between two and three million dollars. Then there's 250 kids going on disability every day in this country. So the debate is this, we, we, we need to develop a paradigm of care, and I think it would involve selective use of the meds and a lot of psychosocial care, which they do in northern Finland, and they have very little uh, disability there. We need to figure out a way to help people go back to work and, and live full-bodied full, full lives. So, and, and we just can't keep going down this way. Yeah, like psychosocial care or something like that. And well, listen, one of the things that's happened in response to this uh, book is a, a foundation has formed. It's called the Foundation for Excellence in Mental Health Care. It got about a $2 million, uh, somebody s uh, s submitted $2 million, and they want to fund research and programs that will provide that sort of initial care, a even for psychotic patients, for whatever. And the, one of the thoughts is if you can take that first moment and not put them on medication and get them through that, you can reduce the chronicity. So well, the problem is we don't have services like that right now, but we need to develop services. So I know I didn't exactly give you advice, uh, but there's also going to be some sense of supporting medication tapering protoco protocols, that sort of thing. Uh, if, if anybody's taking medications, this is not a medical advice book. Do not go off medication <laughs> because of what you hear today. It's difficult to go off medication because your brain has changed, that sort of thing. Uh, so this is not medical advice. It's a societal thing. And going off medication is difficult, and you need to do it with, if you decide to do it, with a lot of support, if you want to try to taper down with a lot of support and, and help. Yes, and I, 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 gotta, I bet I've got to get out of here in about one minute. Go ahead. You know, I haven't seen studies about caffeine. Uh, one of the things, though, I do think they should study is, like, let's say someone has a psychotic break or a manic break after smoking marijuana, like a 19-year-old kid, for months. They really probably should be treating them for substance-induced psychosis and see now if they can get them back to a non-medicated life. But her question really is this. Are there things in diet, are there things in our so way, social way of living that may be triggering a lot of depression, affective disorders? I'm pretty sure the answer is yes, that that's part of what's going. I mean, that the way we're living today is pretty stressful. I haven't seen the caffeine study, but it might be. I just haven't seen it, but I haven't seen it. Do you, I, I don't know if they think, last question. I think I'm supposed to get out of here. Thank you. Go last question. Okay, his question is, maybe the reason for the rise in disabilities is the mentally ill are living longer. One of the reasons. Uh, the problem is the mentally ill now are dying more earlier than ever. And, and one of the things that was reported a couple years ago, the mentally ill are now dr dying 25 years earlier than normal. We've got a big problem with early death that has cropped up in this field. And I think it's pretty, 
pretty clear it has to do with the cocktails that are being prescribed. People aren't just being put on one medication, they're being put on three, four. Um, and there's some new data coming out out of California that, that, that's looking at the average date of their public death, age of death of their public health clients. They're throwing out suicides, they're throwing out accidents. It's 41 years old is what they're getting ready to publish. So anyway, lots of questions. I hope this is just questions. And uh, thanks very much.